Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon from wherever you all are. Um, thank you for joining us today for SNF Agora Conversations, the politics and policy of COVID-19. My name is Hari Han, and I'm a professor of political science and director of the SNF Agora Institute here at Johns Hopkins University. For those of you who don't know, the SNF Agora Institute is an academic and public forum dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as the cornerstone of global democracy. The SNF Agora Conversations is a new weekly series in which we'll take a social scientific evidence-based approach to exploring some of the most vexing political and policy issues surrounding the pandemic. Today's topic is One Pandemic, A World of Responses. We have three terrific guests that are joining me today. With us today are Anne Applebaum, who is a senior fellow um, with the SNF Agora Institute and a staff writer for The Atlantic. Ho Feng Hung, who is the professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at Johns Hopkins University. And Josh Sharfstein, who is vice dean of public health practice and community engagement for the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. I should also mention that jo Josh also runs a daily podcast that has been invaluable during this period called Public Health On Call, in which he brings experts from around Johns Hopkins to pro provide daily public health briefings on the pandemic. So thank you all for being with us today. Um, today with Anne Ho Fung and Josh here, we have expertise on Europe, China, and the United States. Together, the four of us are gonna spend about 30 minutes talking about the comparative response of different countries to the pandemic. What's been going on around the world? Why is there so much variation from country to country? And then we'll open it up for your questions. Thank you to everyone who's already posted such great questions um, to our box, but please know that any time throughout this conversation, you can submit your question through the dialogue box, which should be just to the right of your video or just below the video, depending on the device that you're using. So with that, um, Anne, maybe we can start by turning to you first. Um, I know that you're you know, calling in now from Poland and you wrote a really poignant article in the Atlantic this past week um, describing what it was like for your family to have to rush home to Poland before the borders closed from all over the world. And you described your son who's a freshman at Johns Hopkins University having to literally walk across the border um, with his bags, you know, like you said, kind of like, a, you know, it said, um, as you wrote, like a cold in a Cold War movie about a spy exchange. So first, can you just start by describing to us um, what things are like in Poland, where you are and in general, what are you seeing um, in Europe? So what happened in Poland was that on the 13th of March, the prime minister announced that he was closing the border within 24 hours. Um, it was a surprise announcement. People were not prepared. Um, my husband actually was driving in a car and called me from the road and told me about it. And I was in London and I picked up the phone immediately and bought a ticket and left the next morning. And we also called our son and told him to get on a plane immediately. This was also the moment when President Trump had, was announcing that flights to the UK would also stop. Um, and we all immediately went back. Um, you know, the, 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 you know the, the, the amusing story of my son is that by the time he landed in Europe on, I think it was March 15th, the Polish border was closed. And that meant that there were no trains, no planes, no buses into the country. Um, we got him by plane to Berlin. He got off the plane. Um, he then took a train to the border to this town called Frankfurt under Oder, which is the border city got out of the train. And as you just say, he took his bags and he walked across the bridge, wow. across the Oak River. He saw, you know, policemen with guns. There were guys in hazmat suits taking people's temperatures. There were drones wow. overhead. And for him, it was very shocking. He's 19 years old. He's a freshman at Johns Hopkins. He'd never seen a border between Poland and Germany before. So for him, it was, a, <clears throat> it was very shocking. Um, and then my husband picked him up on the other side. Um, the border closure was that was very interesting. A lot of countries have done it, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the and I and I should add that they cause a lot of chaos. This one left people stranded all over the place um, through an initial misunderstanding. It left a whole line of cars and trucks um, on the German side of the border. People, you know, transit truck drivers trying to get across the country to get home to the Baltic states or to Ukraine. Um, but but it was extremely popular. I mean, it was a, people felt, ah, oh, the government is doing something. Um, and of course it, it was a, in a way it was a fake or a phony gesture. I mean, it, 
you know, the, the, the I, I'm sure the public health scientists can tell us, I mean, the, the question of whether you should or shouldn't close borders is, you know, very muddy and it can depend on the circumstances. Certainly mm -hmm. closing them with no preparation and with no, no, no thought given as to what would happen to people who then concentrated um, on borders trying to get in or out of somewhere wasn't very, wasn't very bright to do it, but it was, it was very popular because partly because the, in a lot of smaller, weaker European countries, we haven't heard mm -hmm. much about them yet, but Poland, the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. um, Slovakia, you have very weak health systems um, and they will be very, very quickly overwhelmed. And a lot of the debates that you had going on, even in Italy or in, or in the UK or in France, you know, should we shut down? Is this the right thing to do? Right. They didn't even have these debates. They shut down immediately um, mm -hmm. because of the fear of what would happen to the healthcare system. So in, in Poland, there's a very, people have been told they haven't shut down all business, but they have told, they've eliminated unnecessary gatherings. They're, mm -hmm. they're telling people to decide. Um, um, and, and people are, for the moment, supportive of those measures, partly because even with a very, very low number of cases, the hospitals are, are already overwhelmed. Um, yeah. You know, I, interestingly, I lived through the, I was actually in Italy when the Italian um, numbers began to rise. Um, in fact, I was at the SICE, Johns Hopkins' mm -hmm. um, school in Bologna. Then I was in London. Then I was in here. Then I was here. Um, and, you know, in each one of these countries, there was a, um, there was a there were there was a debate, but the shortest and briefest debates have been in places where they just absolutely know their healthcare systems can't take it, and they've made very um, dramatic gestures, sometimes unnecessarily, sometimes just for the sake of popularity, partly just to give people some sense that something's happening. Yeah, actually, so I want to pick up on that last thread because you've you know you've also written about how pandemics like the one that we're in right now expose a lot of dysfunctions. Um, any kind of dysfunctions in um, society. And you've also written separately about the ways in which, um, you know, crises like these are opportunities for power grabs by uh, governmental leaders in different ways. And I'm wondering, how are you seeing those patterns come together or not um, in Europe? You know, are there uh, certain kinds of dysfunctions or certain patterns that you see that make those kind of power grabs more or less likely in the countries that you're watching most closely? So, I mean, certainly, first of all, you're absolutely right. You know, back, go all the way back through history. I did this in an article that I wrote for The Atlantic. Every time there's been a pandemic, people who are afraid and who are afraid of being ill are suddenly willing to give all kinds of power to the state that they weren't willing to give up before. They will sacrifice freedom. They will sacrifice privacy um, in exchange for a feeling of safety or health. Right. Um, and we are seeing that really in almost every European country. Um, in most of the larger country, countries, this is happening consensually. So in, yep. you know, in Italy and in France, um, and now in Britain after some wavering, um, there's, there have been government decisions to keep people at home, have wide support, people are, people are accepting them. Um, partly they're accepting them because it's democratic governments are agreeing to do this. And there's a time limit and people understand that when the crisis is over, these kinds of restrictions will end. Um, there are one or two governments where something a little more sinister is happening. Um, in Hungary, um, the debate is going on still this week, but the Hungarian government has proposed, has put a bill before parliament that I think will pass mm -hmm. um, in the next few days, which will give the Hungarian prime minister, in effect, a kind of dictatorial ability to, to ignore all existing law. He can right. bypass laws, hmm. um, do whatever he wants. Um, I think parliament will be suspended. Um, there are some versions that say it will be indefinite, some that say there'll be an endpoint, but that's not clear yet. Um, there's also right. been, uh, there's also part of the law also Oops, says And I think your audio is coming in and out a little bit. Okay, well, I'll try and speak slowly. Um, there's also a law that says that journalists who promulgate fake news about the crisis or false rumors can be arrested for five years. And of course, false news may also include criticism of the government. Um, so there is some, um, there's some fear that the prime minister will make use of this crisis to, to, to prosecute political opponents. Um, I will be very surprised if we don't see that in other parts of the world. Um, we may see it in Russia, we may see it, you know, versions of it already exist um, in China and elsewhere. Um, so the, the pandemic will, um, 
It will give a number of governments a kind of excuse to take more power. It will it will give a lot of people the feeling that government should have more power and the kind of opposition or resistance that you would usually have in normal times um, might well be much less than it would have been. Yeah. Well, this is actually, I would love to bring Ho Fung into the conversation. Obviously, um, Josh, I know that you have a lot to say on this too, but let me just turn to you first for a second, Ho Fung, which is, you know, you've been following very closely um, China's response to the pandemic. And of course, there's been, um, a, you know, what feels like it's been kind of a shifting conversation in the global community about how we perceive the way in which China has handled the um, response. And you wrote about um, the role of authoritarian ideologies in shaping some of what was um, what China did and what some of their early mistakes are. And I'm wondering if you can just share that um, uh, discussion, th those points with our audience here. Yes, definitely. That uh, uh, There's a lot of discussion about how much the, the authoritarian system in China played in the genesis of the virus and the pandemic. Of course, now that now both democratic uh, countries and authoritarian countries are hit, uh, the Italy and and, and U.S. Uh, are doing quite badly, and then surpassing China now. Uh, yeah. But there's two issues here for this kind of disease to to emerge. Um, there's two stage. One stage is that when the human to human transmission started uh, and we res restricted to a few dozen cases, uh, there's a window that actually any government can do something very aggressively, proactively to contain it locally before it spread to become a kind of a, the widespread epidemics or even a pandemics. And after it became an epidemic and a pandemic, it is another question of how to mitigate it and how to contain it. So China definitely missed the window uh, when it first emerged. And it is not the first time I was uh, uh, witnessing the, the SARS outbreak back in, back in 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, at that time, the, the, the virus is not as contagious as this time. And actually, in 2019, that many people forgot about it right now uh, is the swine flu in China. That uh, Ironically, that the Chinese government and the WHO still call it the African uh, swine fever with a place name attached to it. But uh, in 2019, that this, this kind of a swine flu start to uh, uh, happen in China very locally, and then uh, the government uh, keep it in secret and nobody know about it. So the virus spread secretly and, and, and inevitably to become a kind of widespread problem and then start to spread over the border to Southeast Asia. So this time around, the coronavirus is the same thing that when it started in Wuhan, uh, in the November and December, and uh, uh, some frontline doctor in Wuhan discovered it and and, and, and sure that there's human-to-human uh, -human transmission, and then the local authorities and higher up uh, decided to uh, destroy the sample of the testings and then not uh, uh, letting the world know about it. And also, uh, as late as uh, mid-January, that uh, uh, the government of China still denied that uh, there's a human -to human transmission of a new virus, though uh, now in retrospect, we know that they actually at that time they knew. So definitely China, because of this authoritarian instinct of covering up uh, in initially, uh, has missed the window of preventing this uh, disease from uh, turning from a kind of a very local uh, little disease to a global epidemic and pandemic. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, by late January, when the Chinese government act aggressively to put Wuhan in lockdown and then many other countries, and the Wuhan mayor is already saying that before the lockdown, millions of Wuhan people already traveled to other parts of China and the world. So uh, it already started to, to, to make it a, a, a pandemic. And of course, then when it become a pandemic, a uh, widespread epidemic, at uh, how government respond, it depends on a lot of different things. One thing is, uh, for example, when the virus spread to South Korea uh, and to other places like in Europe and now in the U.S., uh, uh, they are all the democratic countries. And, and South Korea in the beginning had some uh, tough time and, and, and it's quite... Uh, uh, quite a mess initially, and then there's a lot of criticism of the government, and then the government uh, acts swiftly uh, to put uh, people under surveillance and quarantine, and then now it is very well contained it because um, uh, the uh, people generally trust the government and then uh, uh, allow the government to to take away some of the liberty. Um, and in the case of Italy, that we don't know yet, uh, more research needs to be done, but uh, anecdotal evidence from journalistic report and things like that uh, show that in the early stage, uh, when Italy start to recognize that there's a problem when the government take action, it seems that uh, there's a lot of 
kind of a high level of trust in the government and many people are not abiding by uh, the quarantine order, the lock, lockdown order. So that it might be one reason why that is spread so widely in uh, Italy. Uh, so that definitely that's the democratic or authoritarian uh, division has something to do uh, with uh, whether the government can act quickly uh, to uh, to take the opportunity in the beginning uh, to prevent a virus from becoming a widespread pan epidemic. But once uh, it becomes epidemic and pandemic, that it is uh, it takes a lot of uh, government capability. People trust in the government rather than just the democratic system uh, to uh, keep this under control. Yeah, so this is actually so Josh, I want to bring you in because probably more than any of us um, and, and more than many people around the world, they, like you've seen this problem from so many different angles, um, serving as you know, a deputy commissioner to the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., the commissioner of health in Baltimore City, you've served in state government, and you've seen it at every different angles and, you know, have written kind of the book on crisis response um, in public health. And so I'd love to hear from your perspective and the experience that you have having worked through a lot of these kinds of crises um, in government. Um, you know, if, you know, most of us don't want to see the kind of power grabs, don't want to see the kind of um, shifts in our government that Anne and Ho Fung describe, but we also need a lot of that kind of centralization to be able to launch the public health response that we need to solve a pandemic like this. So I'd love to hear you talk about how you've balanced those considerations and the work that you've done. You know, um, the fundamental uh, issue for crisis management is you can't manage a crisis through the organizational structure that was designed for everyday management. Yeah. You can't say like, well, you know, the procurement form has to be stamped by the procurement officer and they're out, so we'll wait for them to come back. You right. have to have um, a structure that allows you to make decisions and allows um, actions to happen and is actually structured for the needs of the response. And most people, you know, in, in the United States, we refer to that as an incident management system. It is what got Liberia through the Ebola epidemic. It's what, um, and, and the principles of that is that there is very clear leadership. There's a clear communications effort that is consistent and compelling and, and able to um, provide critical information transparently to the public and answer questions. Um, and that there is uh, all of the different components that are needed are coordinated through uh, a plan that makes sense. Um, and if you don't do that, what you get is chaos where different people think they're in charge or Everybody thinks somebody else is in charge, which is also a big problem. Nobody steps up to make critical decisions. Critical moments aren't surfaced for decisions. And you wind up kind of in the fog of crisis instead of, you know, getting things done. And um, I'm worried, particularly in the United States, that that, you know, fog of crisis still is a characterization of our federal government. We have a situation where... Um, we're running out of ventilators in New York City. Um, Detroit hospitals are already telling people that some people may not get resuscitated. Yeah. And the federal government has not taken over the supply chain, for example, for ventilators or for personal protective equipment for healthcare workers and leaving states to go out and try to buy them uh, competing against each other. It is, you know, it's outrageous given the risks to healthcare workers and to people in the United States. So yes, there does definitely need to be um, focused, improved, different kind of management in a crisis. At the same time, it only works. And this is where I think it kind of um, integrates with the discussion we've had so far. If it has the trust and uh, credibility um, that that is earned by people, in other words, um, in my book, in my class on this um, at the School of Public Health, I see the singular quality that matters more than anything else in crisis management is credibility. If you don't have a credible response, then people don't do what they need to do to protect themselves. Um, they won't believe you know, you when you say you need to stay at home, or they won't believe it's important to wash your hands, um, let alone um, they won't believe that it's necessary to say take over the supply chain for ventilators. Right. And you can, and, and so, um, how you get that credibility is uh, through um, being honest with people, having the people in charge be people who know what they're doing, and um, and really, you know, working with the media, working with the civil society groups, really understanding the concerns and being responsive to them. So I don't think you have to do it in an authoritarian way, but it has to be a different kind of management style. 
Yeah. Well, actually, so Josh, just one point on that is, so if um, that management system hasn't been cultivated and maintained prior to the pandemic in the way that it should have been, you know, can you build it in real time? Like what, you know, what are the things if um, we don't have necessarily that management system in place that we would have hoped that we could be doing now or countries can be doing now to develop what they well, need? Well, I mean, m most countries do practice that kind of management system. The United States certainly does. There's the capability of doing it. What's happening is that people just aren't really using it. I mean, it's it's uh, it's sort of the concept that, you know, where they said there was a plan on a pandemic that they haven't opened up. You know, those plans are for use by that management system in order to be able to be effective. And so what can happen and what typically happens is political considerations, other considerations interfere and people may say, you know, this is a moment of, you know, everybody is waiting to see who steps up to the microphone. How about me? I'll step up to the microphone and I'll, you know, make announcements and, you know, and, and not rely on the plan or people who really know what they're doing to to maneuver the, the city, state, or country through this. Um, and sometimes, you know, that's led people to say things that just aren't true. And that ultimately um, undermines the credibility of the response, which is a real problem when the response requires people to do things to keep themselves and the community safe. So actually, so that makes me want to um, ask a question that I know Anne and Josh, I've heard both of you kind of think about and talk about in different ways, which is, you know, if the information that people and the public are receiving about um, the pandemic is perceived to be politicized in different ways, like how does that, um, A, I guess, how does that impact the kind of trust that Josh, that you're describing that we need? And B, what are ways to keep that information from being politicized or polarized and given the cur current levels of polarization that we see in different countries all over the world. I mean, I'm I, happy to start with that with a historical example, which would be the swine flu outbreak of 1976, mm -hmm. when the president went on TV and said they were going to vaccinate every man, woman, and child against a new strain of flu. Mm -hmm. um, he set that policy in motion, and immediately every uh, people started wondering whether it was a good idea. And yet, um, and he lost a lot of credibility. There was a lot of negative reporting that year. Some public health officials were leaking that this was not necessary, um, and it really undermined uh, confidence in the government's response. And in fact, you know, the critics were right. They rolled out a vaccine program. Some people were injured. The back, the disease itself had disappeared right. from the face of the earth. And so um, there is, you know, I think um, what particularly the lesson I take from that is when a political leader says this is exactly what we're doing, and and really, you know. Th then people are afraid or, or oftentimes the political leader perceives it as flip-flopping, you know, if mm -hmm. they change their opinion. It's much better for a core decision-making and communications effort to be located within the, you know, uh, public health community on something like this. And and people can explain, well, the facts have changed. We're changing our mind. The disease has disappeared as in, if, you know, in 1976, they could have said that. Um, and that allows for more flexibility with the political leader really providing, uh, you know, more of a general vision and support for a more technical response. Right. That seems like a really important point to sort of separate out kind of the scientific expertise that's needed to, to inform and can sort of change as the conditions change, as opposed to those political leaders, which have less room to do so. Um, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts about this question, given the, the work that you've done on polarization and the rise of authoritarianism and so on. So oh, unfortunately, um, in the US, we are getting a kind of real time lesson in the kind of damage that polarization can do. Uh -huh. And one, one of the things that happens when you have a deeply polarized society, in other words, where one group of people um, perceives the institutions of the state as having been captured by an enemy group or by an unpatriotic group or by a um, you know, a, 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 you know, a group whose 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 uh, motives they don't they suspect. One of the things that happens is that people then doubt the, those institutions, and we are seeing that play out right now in real time. Um, you know, I, I don't have to tell everybody who's on this call, you know, what's happened in the United States over the last you know several days, but um, we know that the president was initially skeptical of the need of the virus and need to do anything about it. You know, then he changed his mind. Um, now he's possibly preparing for an economic crisis by saying, well, maybe we don't really need to do all this social distancing and so on. Um, what he's doing is he's setting up 
a, a, a kind of classic polarized response. In other words, that one group of people, a part of his followers, a part of the people who watch Fox News where these slogans are being repeated, are going to doubt the instructions that come from, um, from medical personnel and from public health personalities and also maybe even from governors and mayors. And we'll see how that happens. Some, in some places, governors have enough um, legitimacy and, 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 and generate enough trust that they may be able to overcome this. But certainly at the federal level, we may see large numbers of people simply not believing public health information. Um, and that is that is a direct function of our polarized system. I mean, this, for example, even even in a country like Italy, which normally has very polarized politics and very angry politics, there has been a um, there's been a you know something like ninety percent of the country is in favor of the current policies. The current prime minister, who's a kind of technocrat, enjoys seventy percent support, and you are not seeing a politicized response to the coronavirus policy in Italy. I mean, we might get there eventually, but it's not happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the US, it's begun already. Um, and this, I think, presents a huge challenge um, to American policy because we could get on the, we could get kind of the worst of all possible worlds. In other words, we could get a parts of the economy being shut down, you know, by shelter in place orders. Right. We could get other parts of the economy open. Um, and of course, you know, we are still all one country and the weakest link is where the, is where the disease is going to spread the fastest. Um, and so we may get neither an effective shutdown or effective, you know, suppression of the virus, nor a kind of effective mitigation policy either. And this is really absolutely and directly the result of polarization, the, the people's politicized reactions to the responses. Um, you can also see some people may have seen there are now polls showing extremely, I mean, wide variations in the, in the way that Republicans and Democrats are responding to this crisis. Most high numbers of Republicans say it's being overplayed, it's too, you know, too much hysteria. High number of Democrats say exactly the opposite. So the danger in the US is that the crisis will drive in further deep in polarization and make it very difficult for the US to come up with a single useful response. Yeah, although I have seen some recent polls that are starting to show that the sort of partisan difference on people's perceptions of, pol of the pandemic in the U.S. are starting to come together. Um, but of course, if we're still in very early days, so it's hard to know how that might evolve over time. Um, so you I know, actually want to ask. Yeah, reality might help. In other words, right. as people begin to see the virus, when you know people who've had it, when you're in contact with people at your local hospital and so on, yeah then people's act reactions will be different. At the moment, it's still ex it's kind of mythical to most people. Nobody's exactly. seen it yet. So yeah, it, the it coming week will be over six months, I agree with you. Yeah, really interesting. Um, so I want to turn to audience questions. We've had so many great questions that have come in already, and I just want to remind people, if you do have a question, um, you can just enter it into the, the dialog box that's either to the right or the bottom of your screen. Um, and maybe this first question I'll direct to you, Ho Fung, um, where, um, someone named a uh, gentleman named Joel was asking, um, you know, whether or not China's approach to um, how they contain the pandemic can be used in the United States. There's been a lot of questions about the extent to which um, some of the, um, you know, seemingly harsh approaches to social isolation are really possible in more open kind of small D democratic societies. And I'm curious whether if you have any thoughts about both what China did and how portable uh, those possibilities are. Definitely, uh, there are a lot of discussion about this uh, China uh, supposedly effectiveness in uh, bringing the, the uh, coronavirus in check after it became the widespread pandemic. Again, that uh, the China could have been done a better job in uh, preventing it from the beginning. That there's a UK study showing that if the Chinese government act earlier, uh, three weeks earlier, that there will be 95% fewer cases uh, in the end. Uh, but after the Chinese government acted, that it uh, shows some effectiveness, uh, definitely. A uh, very tough approach to basically that you see pictures about actually the, some the, uh, paramilitary police uh, employed to keep people uh, in, in quarantine and in their building, don't let people come out and things like that. But um, this is kind of a thing that work or lead to uh, be deployed in a situation when uh, people are not trusting the government that much so that they need to have this kind of a very tough and high-handed measure. 
and and it is actually not the kind of thing that uh, that would work in the U.S. Uh, uh, or other democracies. And then for U.S. and other democracies, the model would be really uh, the case of Taiwan and and South Korea that they they also have a, a large scale government and proactive action to uh, test people and then or to put people in quarantine and put whole. Uh, uh, region in, in lockdown, but rather than using a uh, very tough uh, kind of paramilitary approach to, to put people in place that they have this transparency and, and open information so that uh, people know that the trend, the government is not lying, uh, the government uh, is, uh, is, is doing this because of uh, your good, and then after you have these people trust that is uh, impossible with the transparency in media, um, then people will voluntarily uh, abide by by all these uh, the surveillance and quarantine measures. Uh, China have to resort to this kind of a very tough approach because that uh, people don't trust uh, the government uh, provided with this kind of a black box of information, and it has a global implication as well that uh, uh, China. Uh, 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 waste the early uh, month uh, in preventing the disease from becoming a pandemic. Now the China is declaring victory uh, uh, about beating this uh, virus, and 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 the world seems to be uh, have a temptation to to learn from China. But even now that in China, in the internet, and also in some Chinese media, that they are also suspecting whether. Uh, China has successfully contained the disease. We heard from uh, some locality that uh, the Chinese central government seems to want to resume work, but actually people in the local government and in the private enterprise are suspecting it, and they are not sure whether they should uh, trust the government information uh, and resume work or not. So this kind of a transparency and accountability by on the part of the government and uh, maintenance of a, a free public sphere and free media, free flow of information is really uh, something that uh, U.S. and other Western democracy need to uh, do in terms of uh, dealing with the disease. Yeah. So, um, Josh, I want to. I would love to hear. Um, you know what your thought is on some of that. What you've seen in other countries and what you feel like. Um, you know, what are some of the lessons that we can learn from the kind of variation in the global <clears throat> response? But as I pose that question to you, I also want to bring in one other question that comes from Alex, who's an audience member, who asks, um, "How can some of the poor and low-income countries get ahead of?" COVID-19, you know, especially if we think about countries that have a fragile healthcare infrastructure, a lot of poverty, and don't necessarily have access to the resources that a lot of the developed world has to be able to respond to this. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about uh, that topic as well. Sure, those are those are linked topics. Um, right. So, um, you know, the countries that uh, have been able to respond the best are largely in Asia. And the success, I think, hinges on a couple things all a little bit related to the fact that Asia really experienced SARS in 2003 very differently than the rest of the world, because that, that was, I think, a very terrifying experience for them. And that affected um, the population's understanding of what it's, is at stake at a pandemic. I don't think people in the United States really paid much attention to SARS. There were just a few cases in the United States. Um, and H1N1 sort of didn't, you know, was exciting for a little bit, but then turned out not to be that serious in 2009. Um, but in Asia, they took it very seriously. And so they they prepared in a lot of ways. Um, they certainly prepared on testing, but it's not just testing. I think that's an important point. It's testing and what happens after testing. Mm -hmm. um, the key to controlling an infectious disease is stopping the ability of one person with the disease from passing it on to other people. That That's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And um, what that requires is finding people who have the disease and isolating them taking their contacts and quarantining them and waiting, keeping people, get, basically denying the ability of the virus from jump, jumping uh, from one person to another. That is not, you know, in South Korea, they did it in a very high tech way. They did testing, then they did, they looked at your phone and they did text messages, same thing in Taiwan. Um, but that, you know, can be done without all that high tech, you know, it can be done with really good, you know, public health work mm -hmm. to, um, to, to find people who are infected, ideally test them, if not make a presumptive diagnosis based on people's symptoms, act like they're positive, find their contacts, quarantine their contacts. And that is the best way to control the spread of the disease. So 
handling sick patients requires a medical infrastructure and low and middle income countries are in you know big trouble for that. That was the finding of the um, health index that the Center for Health okay. Security worked on. But for these core public health functions, just like Anne said, you know, countries with that are worried about their health infrastructure should be super aggressive on the social distancing. They need to really strengthen their, their public health ability to um, identify either presumptive or certain cases and rapidly intervene. Unfortunately, I think we're learning the wrong lesson in the United States from these experiences. We're learning that like, um, they did a lot of tests in South Korea. So we should do a lot of tests. And you know, they, you know, it's good for all these famous people to get tested because we need a lot of tests. A test really doesn't do that much by itself. Self-awareness is not that helpful here. You yeah. know, because if the name of the game is shutting down the spread from one person to another, it's testing plus follow-up that makes a big difference. Right. And the follow up is really dependent on people's trust in the governmental and social and political institutions that are asking them to isolate themselves as needed. Sounds like. I, I think that's absolutely true. And I think it speaks to this underlying issue of credibility. Mm -hmm. You know, people will do things um, if they believe it's credible. I think, truthfully, the Asian countries have had a huge advantage um, over the rest of the world because when the government in there there says this is a pandemic you know this is a serious infectious disease threat we need you to stay at home they all remember sars right. and so that that's just a huge advantage in trying to get people to realize the seriousness of the situation and believe those kinds of messages here you know when you say you got to you know you can't go out to eat you can't go to a bar you can't people just like what and then to have yeah. mixed messages about that without that experience on the back end of what you know it's hard to think on the back end of this big surge people right. will take this more seriously, but it's just gonna be a very difficult time to get there. Yeah. So we have a question that came in from the UK, um, which um, where the questioner asked, you know, whether or not there have been any efforts um, or what you think of the efforts that do exist um, you know, that are cross-governmental collaborations to try to create a unified global strategy for this, you know, given the disparities in I mean, we're obviously seeing a lot of disparities just within the United States in the ways that we've already talked about it, but we're seeing all sorts of disparities across the world. And I'm curious if any of you have um, a sense of what the possibilities are for creating some kind of global strategy that um, um, that will allow for this. Hopefully, yeah, I have uh, 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 some observation because I, I read the SARS and write about it uh, back in 2003 and then uh -huh. and close observing how the things evolved this time. Uh, regarding the role of WHO, that WHO uh, is supposed to be the global organization that do the job in monitoring and warning countries about diseases coming, um, and then and then uh, provide intervention and help uh, in countries with less resource and things like that. Uh, in 2003, the WHO did a very good job in, for example, putting pressure on on, on China and other government that uh, seems to be a lot very open up in their information and. And, and warn the world uh, that a serious thing is uh, coming, uh, need to get prepared. It. And But this time around, there's a lot of criticism that after the crisis is over, I think there's a lot of question to ask about WHO role, uh, role in uh, making the crisis more serious than it could have been. Uh, because in early on that uh, now we know that the State Department in the U.S. has confirmed that and media report confirmed that back in uh, late de December, uh, the Taiwan government, uh, according to the intelligence on the ground in China, already uh, warned about this uh, new virus that has uh, passed the phase of human-to-human -human transmission. And because for political reasons, uh, Taiwan is not the member of the WHO, but they still relay the information to the WHO and the WHO just said, well, we heard that. And they didn't do anything about on this in piece of intelligence. On the other hand, the WHO, again, because of some political reasons, uh, trust the Chinese government uh, worth 100%. And so as late as uh, mid-January, WHO is still tweet that uh, there's low evidence that this new virus has human-to-human uh, -human transmission. Uh, so the world didn't get the warning that uh, uh, that they lead. Uh, that at that time, even though that this has something to do with China cover up and the WHO tilted toward the Chinese government in, in trusting the information from there. So. Uh, uh, we really need to have a global institution and revive the credibility now. The WHO seems to be uh, lost a lot of credibility after this. And, and uh, so we need to have a lot of questioning and reflection about what WHO can do to revive its uh, credibility and, and its uh, capability to monitor and, and, and spread information about this uh, disease in the next crisis to come. Josh, do you want to weigh in here? Just maybe, I mean, I, I, I think that's a very, very important observation. I would just say that um, 
I've heard, I, I spoke to Andy Pekos, who's a professor of virologist at the School of Public Health, that on a regular basis, virologists from around the world are getting on a call and just sharing as much data as they can with each other. Mm -hmm. So I think the scientific community um, is probably doing a much better job than the government you know, uh, world, uh, where this crisis is being reflected in all sorts of different political ways including you can hear in you know the different things that our government says uh, rather than realizing this is a common enemy that we all should be um pooling our intellectual and material resources to defeat right so i feel like we have a series of questions that i can kind of clump into one domain that i'll pose as our final question i think for the panelists today which is um Given the various missteps that we've seen in the early response that different governments have taken all over the world and different people have um, identified different ones um, in the questions, um, and, and the sort of fact that, you know, moving forward, these questions about trust, um, about credibility of the governmental response, about the sort of, you know, distinction between the science and the politics and all the other things that we've talked about today aren't necessarily going to be solved, you know, just because we had this great webinar, right? And so what would be the advice that each of you have for our audience in terms of what they can do um, to you know, other than socially distancing and adhering to the public health guidelines that are given to us, what are the things that people can do to make sure that we prepare ourselves for um, what needs to happen in the coming months? And so maybe, Josh, I'll start with you and then circle back to Ann and Ho Fung before I wrap us up. I'm very interested in what they have to say, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, uh, well, you know, in addition to the basic public health recommendations, I think it's important for people to um, ask for facts and ask to hear from people who know what they're talking about um, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how to respond. Um, I, I think people have to take the long view. It's not um, all only what's happening today, but what is the path through this? Um, what are the key milestones? And how can um, cities, states, counties, you know, what's the role they have to play so that individuals can see how they can be supportive in other ways for where they are. For example, um, a rational approach to this might say, we absolutely have to safeguard nursing homes, assisted living, and other congregate settings where people at super high risk for serious illness and death live. Mm -hmm. We need an approach to protect them we're going to be, you know, over time building a series of safeguards. So even as we're reopening the economy, we're protecting people at the highest risk. And here's how everybody can help. You know, I'm not saying people have to come up with that strategy, but they should be asking for what are the core pieces, the building blocks that we need to get through this? And what's the evidence that's based on? What can we all do? And really looking for scientific and public health leadership to, to shine a light through through all these, you know, very difficult immediate challenges that we'll be facing. Great, thank you. Anne? So look, I, I've written this in the last couple of weeks. I think um, if we just focus on the US for a moment, but this applies to, to a lot of European countries as well. I think we need to understand that the US needs a very profound, almost kind of revolutionary change uh -huh. in its attitude towards bureaucracy, uh -huh. um, you know, more generally and public health specifically. Um, we've allowed this situation to develop whereby unqualified people are given jobs in Washington, um, whereby the prestige and status of government work has been allowed to fall. Um, and where, you know, even in the, I mean, I, and I don't mean all over the government, it's not, it's not that we need to expand government, but we, we cannot afford anymore in the 21st century to have, you know, to have a situation that we have at the present whereby the president has dismissed the pandemic team, um, the top scientists don't work in Washington, or even where, as, as Josh was saying, where the, you know, the scientists now have an international conversation, but at the top level government officials aren't having that conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to re, we need a, a, you know, kind of revolutionary changes in how we think think about the state and about bureaucracy um, in all of our countries. Um, and, you know, this is ultimately a political question and people should think about who they vote for in the next election um, and how they participate in politics and public life. You know, do you want to live in a country with a modern state where 
where people are prepared for this kind of crisis and they think about it in advance? Or do you want to live in a state where we have this kind of 19th century amateurish fumbling? Um, and I think it's a, you know, these are, these are actually quite profound political questions. What kind of people do we want to have lead us? What kind of state, what kind of society do we want to have? I mean, I, I realize those sound very long-term and grandiose, but over the next few weeks and months, as we have you know, time to think about um, the flaws in our political system, I hope people will focus on some of these really much broader ideas. Um, and then on top of that, I would say everybody should start thinking about how they can volunteer, how they can help organize in their local neighborhood, um, you know, food deliveries for people who are shut in, um, eventually, um, uh, you know, other, other kinds of help for people who are unemployed. You know, I hope people use this moment as a, to become as public spirited as they can. Thank you. That's very helpful and warms my heart to hear an SNF Agora fellow talking about um, building up the civil society that binds us all. Um, Hofang, I'll give you the last word before I wrap us up. Yeah, I've, I know we are running off time, but uh, actually that as George said, uh, the memory of SARS is very important. And as Anne said, that this grassroots initiative uh, to protect ourselves is important in that note, that uh, the case of Hong Kong is really something that we need to observe because Hong Kong has all the bad uh, governing situation and deficit in trust in government and things like that. But still, it has been doing relatively well in these epidemics. And one key issue is that people really take their own initiative to 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 practice voluntarily social distancing and helping out each other, and also to, uh, to practice personal hygiene, wash the hand, and wearing face masks. That it is kind of controversial in in, in Western society about face masks, but as scientifically, it is said that it might not protect you. But actually, if you get the disease, that actually reduce the chance that you can spread the disease to other particles. For this coronavirus, that there's a lot of people who has low symptoms. They don't know about that, and then they still spread around. So. Uh, a universal face masking actually is the more people getting uh, paying attention to that might be a way uh, to actually help stem the, the disease spreading. And then the case and experience of Hong Kong is something that uh, actually we need to pay more attention to. Well, Anne, um, Ho Fung and Josh, I really want to thank you all for being with us today. And thank you to our audience for watching and for sending in so many great questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to them all. But I hope that you will join us again next Friday when we'll be discussing the idea of imagining a new moral economy. Um, the pandemic creates an opportunity for us to reimagine the kind of economy that we want. And can we imagine an economy that puts people and not profits at the center, but also works to promote human flourishing? And our guests will be Margaret Levy, who is the director of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, and also serves on the academic advisory board for the SNF Agora Institute. Um, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who's the CEO of the New America Foundation, and Angus Bergen, an associate professor of history here at Johns Hopkins. I also wanna mention that the recording of today's webcast will be available on our website, which is snfagora.jhu.edu. So thank you very much to our panelists and I hope that we'll see you all again next week. Thank you. Thank you.